that (laughs) um okay we got that going let me pull up the event (laughs) and the fact that it gives us the option to leave the meeting (laughs) Uh, oh i didn't know that i didn't know that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um (laughs) is my sound okay i mean you sound you don't have your regular mic with you do you no, I don't. I, yeah, I, you, you can it. tell. You kind of sound like you're talking through a phone, actually. Oh, well. Hey, whatever. I... Yeah, what are you going to do? Yep, exactly. So let me... Someday when I'm rich and famous. <laughs> hmm. Let me start updating this. Okay. And I'm going to take us live. I'm just filling out all of the Facebook Live information because... Mm-hmm. It makes you do that now. Yes, it does. Okay, I'm about to hit go live. So, um, Wendy, you can see me. I'll just point okay. and start talking. Nick, are you ready to go? Yep. Okay, here, just wait. And good evening, everybody. Here we are. Another marvelous Mystic Moon Cafe evening. Well, okay, it's a little warm, but uh, we have we have Jake on the on the screen with me and everything this time. Hello. Happy folks. <laughs> and we have Mr. Nick Redfern on um, the telephone. So he will be the voice from above or from the voice from nowhere. Ooh. Hey guys. Hey. hey. <laughs> And tonight we will be going over his his one of his newer books out, um, Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracy, and the Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe. So uh, welcome, Nick. Yay. Oh, well, thanks for having me on the show again. Oh, oh yeah. golly. Thanks for agreeing. Yeah, this is never a problem, Nick. Never. No, never, ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I have a confession to make. The doggy, <clears throat> the doggy ate my notes. Um, yeah, uh, while I was in the shower, he got a hold of my notebook because it looked tasty, I guess. And uh-huh. uh, so, so I'm, I'm just, I'm a look, at a little bit of a loss. I know, you know, most of, most of it, but we know how my memory is these days. So, Jake, do you want to start us off with? Uh, yes. Because. I have the book open. Mm-hmm. I have it on Kindle. So the book is literally open in front of me on the screen. So if you see me, okay. Okay. I'm not being disrespectful, but I, <laughs> I'm just doing two screens here. Okay. I'm okay. double fist in my digital display. Um, so Nick, with this book, let, let's just say this one's got it all. <laughs> You've got murdered Hollywood starlets corrupt politicians well let's be real aren't they all um (laughs) cia fbi ngos the soviets aliens how did this book idea come together uh and why now well um well that's a good question or both of them are good questions um (laughs) the story um basically revolves around the death of marilyn monroe um, who died um, on August the 4th, 1962, under very um, mysterious and controversial um, situation. And there have been ye- um, rumours and theories over the years, you know, that she may have been taken out by government agents, that kind of thing, or hired assassins, something along those lines. And um, in 1995, a new thread was sort of introduced into the story 
when a very controversial and questionable um, document surfaced. And in essence, it was purported to be a classified CIA document that somebody had leaked outside of the confines of the CIA and had handed it over to one or two people, copies of it, um, in the UFO research community in the early 1990s, 91, 92. And um, it was in 95 when the document uh, became public um, data, really, uh, because you cannot sort of really copyright a government document. It's just um, it's just the way it is. Um, and when this story broke that uh, the CIA document talked about the CIA listening in on various uh, phone calls of people like um, Marilyn and um, a well-known um, journalist at the time named Dorothy Kilgallen. The document basically has the CIA listening to Marilyn and some of her friends like and colleagues like Kilgallen, and they're all talking about um, how the Kennedy brothers, JFK and RFK, supposedly told Marilyn all about the, the crash of a UFO and dead aliens as a means to try and um, to get her into the bedroom, impress her into the bedroom, so to speak. And um, now the question is, or and still is to this day, you know, is the document real um, or is it a sophisticated hoax? Now, if you look at the document, um, one thing we know for sure is that the um, the layout of the document is 100% accurate for a CIA document, like a case file document for that era. We also know that the type uh, face in the document does come from the 1950s through the early 60s. So if it's a hoax, somebody went to a lot of a uh, you know a lot of went, uh, work went into it to try and. To, to to sort of fake us, to hoax us, um, and and with no particular agenda. Nobody ever came forward and said, gotcha, or anything like that. And when I first heard this story, I thought, well, you know, the Kennedys and the JFK's assassination and UFOs and aliens and, you, you know, the mysterious death of Marilyn and all this is together – you know, it makes you think there's just no way, you know, that this all could be, you know, it's just way too much, just too, so, you know, too sensational, kind of like, you know, the, you know, sort of checking out at the at the checkout store, you know, <laughs> the, the, at the store and you see these sort of lurid headlines. But the more you look into it, the more intriguing it becomes. And, um, and one of the things... Um, I did want to sort of um, explain for the listeners, although this story has been going on for sort of 25 years, um, it doesn't mean I've actually done nothing but, you know, sort of upset <laughs> on this document and this story for 25 years. I'd be a pretty tragic per person if I did that, you know. But mm -hmm. basically what it is, I'll, rather than saying I've done, you know, I've been working on it for 25 25 years that's sort of um the word is quite off it's actually it's uh, over the course of 25 years i've followed this story and it may have been you know i did one um week of of a new part of the story in one year and then there may not be anything else for another 18 months you know because things kind of um seep through bit by bit so um it, there's a it, I've sort of looked into this story over the course of 25 years rather than obsessively for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be much of a life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, a, a life of the mind is yeah. the most important life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's been way too many other books. We know you haven't just sat there and, and yeah. obsessed over this one. No. Yeah, the fans know. <laughs> The fans know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. But um, but that's sort of the the basic background of the story. This document surfaces from like a nineteen nineties uh, version of like um, Edward Snowden, and um, 
and you know as i said the big question is is the document real and if it is real mm -hmm. you know is it but then it obviously tells the real truth of marilyn's death mm -hmm. um and if it isn't the real thing then what's the point of spending a lot of time and effort to find a 1950s era typewriter to actually also get um paper um, which is yellowed and clearly old as well, mm -hmm. um, and to give it to, a, that it was passed on to in 95 to a man named Milo Spiriglio. Mm -hmm. Milo Spiriglio was a guy who uh, wrote three books on Marilyn's death and uh, in the 1990s, and uh, excuse me, one in the 1980s, two in the 90s. And... Um, he was someone who was really sort of obsessed, um, you know, um, writing three books. Uh, had, had he done, um, he not died in 2000, he probably, uh, excuse me, 2010, um, you know, he probably would have continued. Um, but the document was handed over to him and he didn't really know what to do with it because, you know, up until that point, he never considered on the possibility of there being a connection between Marilyn Monroe and UFOs. And so he put on a uh, press conference in California in uh, 1995, just in part to, to see if this would bring anybody else to come forward. And um, there were some vague um, stories and things like this and, um, you know, could you trust the people or not, that kind of thing. Um, and so that's how it sort of began. Um, it went from allegedly being leaked um, by an elderly archivist in the CIA, supposedly, um, because it's only one document, one page. The story is that this elderly archivist was able to slip it out of the CIA, which isn't impossible. I mean, consider everything that, um, you know, Snowden did and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, took everything out of the NSA. Um so um, we don't know, you know, who this um, archivist is, or even if there is an archivist, you know, or was. And we just, you know, this is, you know, one of the issues of the, the document. And so from there, Spiriglio didn't really know what to do with it, and he kind of left it alone. And so he kind of then went back to the UFO research community, but the, the key figures mentioned in the document, as I said, the, it's a CIA document. The, the document, if you read the document, it's interesting because the CIA actually, you can tell, didn't really know what was going on, but they were trying to find out. That's why they were listening to, like, Dorothy Kilgallen's phone and Marilyn's phone, because they were trying to find out what the, the Kennedys had told Marilyn, rather than the fact that they didn't actually know, you know, so they mm -hmm. were in the dark. But the, the people involved, um, uh, one of them, um, as I said, was, was Dorothy Kilgallen, this journalist who died um, in 1965 while investigating the JFK assassination. She knew uh, Marilyn. They met on a number of occasions. Um, and, you know, the more you look into it, for example, one of them is James Jesus Angleton, and he was one of the key figures in the CIA. And um, he was also the guy who, it's almost certain, who, when Marilyn died, that he confiscated her diary, which contained all sorts of manner of uh, tidbits and rumours and secrets that the Kennedys told Marilyn. And they didn't realise, you know, that um, she'd got this... Um, sort of expansive diary where she put in all the information that the Kennedys had told her. And um, now the other one we've got, who's another interesting um, character in the story, um, well, they all are really. <laughs> but um, when, you, when you look at the story, one of the primary characters is one who actually um, most people have never heard of. His name's Howard Roth, uh, Rothberg. Howard Rothberg was a New York house designer, um, but he was also plugged in with a lot of the celebrities, uh, movie celebrities, theater celebrities who lived in the New York, York area. And, uh, and he was, she was also 
uh, excuse me, uh, he was very friendly um, with Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen. So, in other words, you've got this circle of people and they'd all heard these rumours about Marilyn and um, UFOs. And that's how the CIA got onto the story via what the Kennedys told Marilyn and then the CIA are like, well, what's this all about crashed flying saucers and Marilyn's death? We need to start, um, you know, plugging into the phones of everybody who knows Marilyn and try and find out what was going on. So that's basically the, the background. Um, as I said, that the typeface, um, you know, works for the time period. The paper does. Um, and I actually did sort of like a, a check to see, you know, if um, if there was any way to find out, you know, places where you could specifically buy old paper and old typewriters. And you can at certain places, okay. you know, you can get it. Um, but again, you know, if you're if it's just a joke, why go to such um, lengths? You know, um, right. what was the agenda if it isn't the real deal? Now, I'm not saying it is the real deal. I mean, that's one of the things in the book. I've I've really written it from the perspective of going for the answers rather than going from like a, Mox, a Fox Mulder, I want to believe <laughs> kind of angle. You know, I hope it doesn't come across like an, uh, that angle I want to believe rather than, um, you know, I, I just wanted to go where the evidence takes me. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's sort of the, you know, the beginnings of it, how it began um, with this document supposedly being siphoned out the CIA handed over to Spiriglio and um, nobody knows what to do with it. Nobody even sure what it is. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's kind of like the, the first um, thread in the story, if you like. Okay. I was going to say, as I was reading the book, because um, I came in it from more of a, a Hollywood fan standpoint and, and the good hot dish of, of Hollywood stars at the time. <laughs> and so with Marilyn and you reference this as chapter 10 in your books so if everyone, you don't have the book, you know, go download it now. Um, you talk about Marilyn and she actually had a pretty solid connection to the Soviets at the time, which I had never known anything I uh, hadn't either. I, about, I mean, cause you just gotten through McCarthyism, you know, mm -hmm. and it's the mid fifties and all of a sudden she's planning a trip to the Soviet union. And you know, the FBI was, Oh, yeah. Was starting well, to, so what was going on with Marilyn and, and the Soviets? Um, well, I mean, again, this is an important part of the story because, you know, I mean, um, Marilyn was actually a really good actress, you know, um, but she, in the in the public, she had this kind of ditzy blonde, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of um, legend attached to her, if you like. But that was not like her in the real world. You know, she was very um, well read and she was in, deeply interested in politics. And she, in the 50s, actually 1954, she started um, thinking about if she could go to the Soviet Union, see Russia, and to see what it's really like versus, um, you know, what it, we're told it's like. And, um, and J. Edgar Hoover basically flipped his lid and um, he did not want her to go at all. Um, now, so what happened was that the, uh, both the CIA and the FBI in 1955, this was just after she applied to get a visa, um, in 1995, both the CIA and the FBI opened files on Marilyn and some of the FBI's files on Marilyn were handed over to the CIA. Uh, which is almost unheard of. Agencies mm -hmm. don't really always, you know, get together. You know, very often the CIA and the FBI never ever, you know, sort of work together unless it was important. So, you know, that's an intriguing thing as well. Um, and that 1955 was when um, the surveillance of Marilyn began, all because of her interest, a growing interest in politics and so on. And also... 
um, like uh, Joe, Joe DiMaggio, uh, one of her husbands, the famous baseball player, um, it was he who actually recommended Marilyn that she put together um, a journal or a diary. And this wasn't going to be, you know, like... Um, you know, dear diary, I went down to the park today, you know, that kind of thing. It was not, it wasn't going to be one of them kind of diaries, you know. It was going to be, um, because she would be, she was already start of, you know, um, sort of rubbing elbows with the movers and shakers in Hollywood and also people in politics, celebrities, powerful figures. And so she essentially um, would, feel, she got, the, I mean, the doc. By all accounts, this diary was like bulging by the time of her death, you know, oh. and um, and reportedly um, she, uh, you know, anything that came her way by the Kennedys and people in the world of politics and things like this, she wrote it all down. And, and it was only, you know, when um, things got close to her death that the Kennedys, I mean, this part of the story, we can verify mm -hmm. that the Kennedys were deeply concerned that all of these secrets and tidbits and gossip that she heard, they didn't realize she got this diary, you know, she'd go home every night or wherever and, you know, three or four pages today, three or four pages the next day about, you know, what Jack Kennedy said to her to this day about Cuba and Castro and things like this. And so, um, the diary itself was one of the things almost guaranteed to see her, you know, sort of um, killed, really, because yeah. it was filled with so many secrets. So, so from '55, you got the CIA and the FBI watching um, Marilyn. You've got then the the development of the story and the revelations concerning the diary, and then if you read through the um, FBI file on Marilyn, which you can read it. Um, if you go to the FBI's official website, which is called The Vault, just go mm -hmm. to vault.gov, G-O-V, um, and then look, uh, scroll down, and you'll see um, all the, the PDF files. You can download them, print them, whatever you want to do. However, the, the file runs to about 250 pages. Okay. We know, though, that when J. Edgar Hoover died in 1972, that a number of his aides helped to remove um, some of the more private files, more <laughs> sensational files that Hoover had kept away from the regular surveillance files. And there are rumors that the the original full file on Marilyn was somewhere in the, in the range of about 4,000 pages. Um, and all we've got now is like 200 pages, and the rest were reportedly, um, as I said, taken away mm -hmm. when Hoover died, and Hoover's uh, and, and at um, Hoover's orders, um, the um, his aides took away all the more inflammatory uh, files, and, and we don't know what happened to them. One of the rumours is they were taken to the guy I mentioned earlier, James Jesus Angleton, one of the big players in the CIA. And the rumours is that he took them and. Um, sort of, um, you know, hidden them away somewhere, in, either in some cellars or somebody else's home, you know, just somewhere uh, out of the way. Um, and if, uh, but even in the files that we've got, this 250 pages or thereabouts, I mean, there's a lot of innuendo there that reached um, um, the, the FBI itself, you know, and, and Hoover himself. And... Um, the, those documents talk about um, numerous rumors about RFK, Robert Kennedy, having a, a long-standing affair with Marilyn and with JFK to a lesser degree. Um, and and they were even, they even foreign Marilyn um, on a number of occasions when she went on vacation to Mexico and, and followed her in the hotel. That's the extent, and that was the reason was being but, uh, because Marilyn had got a new boyfriend um, in Mexico who was actually um, tied to uh, one of the communist um, organizations in Mexico, which didn't go down well at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, one thing that well, there's a couple of things. Um, with Marilyn's death and the conspiracies around that. But the one thing I find interesting is 
in the book, it talks about her red diary going with her to the coroners and that's where it went missing. But since when do they pack up personal belongings like that to take to the coroners? Mm, well, that, that's a good point. Um, what we know for sure, again, you know, I mean, whether you put UFOs into the story or not, what we do know for sure is that um, Marilyn died or, or she was found dead on mm -hmm. August the 4th. 1962 and on the night of the um of the third um you know this is where things started to spiral down into sort of chaos and you know mm -hmm. she was throwing pills down her throat and um you know totally um, out of it and the, um, of the third, um you know this is where throw and um you know totally out of are we it. having a tech back back up probably Okay. Sorry about that. Yep, it's yep, men in black. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Nick, you were saying? Yeah. Well, oh, shall I carry on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. Sorry we're we're just that. a little bit okay. of feedback, a little bit of feedback mm -hmm. in the tape delay. Okay, cool. <laughs> I thought it was the men in black. <laughs> <laughs> it may be. <laughs> it could yeah. Be, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, basically what happened the night before, you know, she was in very desperate state, depressed, etc. And um, one of the theories is, you know, that she was murdered. Another one is that she was sort of in the weeks uh, or, or months um, leading to her death, you know, that um, various people were sort of just pummeling her with sort of like psychological warfare, you know, put in a state of just... Um, chaos and depression mm -hmm. to where it would almost be you know she would have killed herself out mm. of the state she was in but it was sort of almost like directed you know in the in the form of a murder but but passed off as a as um you know a suicide that kind of thing but either way you know um she either killed herself or she was deliberately driven down that pathway and that's what most researchers think that it wasn't so much an assassin it was like a psychological mm. uh, pummeling of her you know yeah, by it, people who knew how to do that yeah because um, she she did suffer from quite a bit of depression and other yeah, mental illnesses yeah. so yeah she did and um but what happened was, to get back to your point, um, is that when she died, a number of her possessions went with her. And we know from the people who worked in the coroner's office and also um, within the morgue that the diary had been seen by a number of people who obviously would have been there when Marilyn was brought in. So, you know, we're talking about people in the coroner's office um, you know, the morgue, that kind of thing. And a number of those people, one or two of them still alive, um, said that they um, they saw this diary and some of them had the chance to read a few pages which did talk about um, plans to invade Cuba, to assassinate um, Castro, even to work uh, alongside the mafia with particular, um, you know, sort of... Um, awkward and controversial projects and things like this um and what they also said was that after about two or three days later um some of those possessions were still there however the diary itself was gone and hmm. nobody has seen it since now there have been claims where people have said you know they've got it stashed away in somebody's attic you know by somebody else's grandmother or whatever but none of that has ever you know actually been able to we've never been able to prove that you know it's kind of almost like um of a friend of a friend story in which of course in this field you know you get things like that you know kind of like um my next door neighbor's aunt's uncle's sister's brother <laughs> uh, once, met, once met somebody you know once met somebody who said you know his next door neighbor met the guy who had the diary that that, that kind of story is like a nightmare you know <laughs> when yeah. you oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah but but that, but somebody probably has it because because of all the inflammatory information in this gigantic bulging um, diary, I would think 
rather than destroy it, I think they, you know, if it was the CIA, FBI, whoever it was, I think the, the likelihood is that they would keep it um, on file because mm -hmm. who knows, you know, further down the line, 10 years, 15 years, something might crop up where they need to refer to that, mm -hmm. what was in it, you know, in case somebody else needs to know about it, whatever. Um, so I think it would be reckless to destroy it and and never be able to refer back to it. So mm -hmm. somewhere it probably is, you know, probably 200 feet underneath Area 51 guarded by a bunch of vicious German shepherds or whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> a chimera Fenris. We all know they got the, we got, they got the heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> no, but I... I, I I could see why they would keep it under wraps because generally, I mean, yeah. I, I did work when I was in the military. I, I did work for intelligence. Yes, I know it's an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> but usually after a 70-year period, they start to declassify a lot of stuff unless mm -hmm. it could. there's still people alive or it could still be damaging to governments. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we're, I think we're at the point with at least the Kennedys and with the Castros, eh, eh, you know, that ship has sailed. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, um, go ahead. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the that's where it, the, that part of the story gets to, you know, Marilyn's death. Um, the diary's gone. She's dead. You know, she's not able to obviously, you know, respond or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, sort of the 60s, um, you know, um, it's, it's a situation where, for example, um, you know, when you've reached that point um, through the 60s and 70s, I mean, you know, you've got a number of books written about Marilyn, some from just on sort of, you know, celebrity type mm -hmm. books, others on, you know, books, non fiction books about, you know, her, her death, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there was nothing, I guess, uh, what you would call really, you know, sort of eye opening, that kind of big sort of in the 70s you know when you had a lot of um sort of investigative journalistic books you know kind of yep. like all the president's yep. men and a lot of those books became very popular and that's when you started to see books coming out about marilyn and was she murdered and that kind of thing and that that's when things started to sort of change you know in the 70s um mm. and um but again, at that time, 70s, 80s, no one was talking about UFOs, at least publicly, and, and wouldn't have done had it not been for that alleged leaked um, document. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and more than anything else, it was a fascinating story. And, um, and so I took the, the view, well, yet it is so sensational. It's, you know, whatever the answer is, there's no point just leaving it there, you know, not doing mm -hmm. anything about it. So. Yeah. So the next thing that I thought was really intriguing and this, um, it seems like this gentleman could be a good source if he wasn't so evasive, but I found chapter 13, an old man with secrets of Maryland about Daniel Salter, I think is mm -hmm. how you pronounce his last name. Seemed like yeah, he Daniel came Salter. across like he knew a lot. I mean, he, he's got leads with, ufos he's got we've got a mafia connection with the rat pack right uh and a lot of people close to maryland but it sounds like you had a bit of an adversarial <laughs> interview or series of interviews with him what's the scoop there well yeah i mean this goes back to um 2003 and um again this was like you know over the course of these 25 years you know i get a snippet here and a snippet there and I got word of a guy named Daniel Salter, and he died a few years ago. But you can, he's a real guy, and that's his real name. And, uh, and you can find his obituary online. And uh, Daniel Salter lived in Taos, New Mexico, for much of his life. And I got a sort of like a, um, a tip off um, that he knew something about the, the Marilyn document. But not just that, but he knew about um, other issues in relation to Marilyn. And so I thought, well, you know, I've got a few days off. Uh, why not go um, on a road trip and see, you know, what I can find? Because I like doing road trips, you know, it's fun. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and and that's what I did. And um, me and a girlfriend at the time, we decided to do that. And um, she wasn't that much interested in Marilyn and and dead aliens, but uh, we had a good time. And, uh, <laughs> Sounded like you had really great tacos. Just reading the chapter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, but um, him. His story is a fascinating one because he was who he claimed to be, he did work in the intelligence community, and this was up until um, the 60s, and then he sort of backed away from it. But, you know, like a lot of these people in intelligence, they never kind of really fully retire, you know, or they or they re- ask to come forward and, you know, do one last um, program for them or whatever, but, you know, that kind of thing. Now, the reason why I wanted specifically to uh, interview him was because he claimed not just um, knowledge about the document, but he he had information that had a lot to do with Marilyn and UFOs, but that had nothing to do with the data um, in the um, the document itself. And this all revolved um, a guy around a guy named Kenneth Battelle. Now, Kenneth Battelle uh, was like what today we would call a celebrity hairdresser, that kind of thing, you know, the mm-hmm. sort of like a hairdresser to the stars, that sort of thing. And um, and when Marilyn was in um, California, that's where he worked at, excuse me, New York. Um, and um, so when she was in California, which is her primary area, you know, she would have a hairdresser there. But she had this hairdresser in New York when she was on the East Coast, you know, filming or whatever. Um, her hairdresser there was this guy, Kenneth Battelle. Now, Dan Salter told me that he had connections um, with Kenneth Battelle and that Kenneth Battelle knew something about Marilyn and crashed UFOs and dead aliens. And the, the inference was that um, that Battelle, being so close to Marilyn, to the extent, you know, that, uh, as I said, on the, when they're on the East Coast, you know, he was her hairdresser. So, you know, that's really close. Um, but um, Salter said that, um, that Battelle had been given this story, whether directly from Marilyn or from one of her colleagues or friends but whatever the I don't know the answer to that and neither did he but he said um, Salter didn't know I should say um, but but he said that he did get that story way back then uh, Battelle got this story way back in the early 60s that a story was going around sort of along the, alongside this sort of little group of people who worked alongside you know celebrities and heard these rumors and um and Battelle supposedly um got the story of the dead aliens and the crashed UFO from Marilyn and what's intriguing is that Battelle actually um years later also um worked as a hairdresser um for, for JFK's wife, um, you know, so we've got, oh, you know, we've got, oh, yeah. yeah, so you know, we've got a, a situation there. You know, you've got you've got Jackie Kennedy um, having her hair done by um, by Battelle, and it just turns out, you know, that he also did Marilyn's hair. So there's another JFK and Jackie connection mm-hmm. and Marilyn connection, and one of the things that I found um, sort of impressive and, and positive about Salter was the fact that if he didn't say, if he, if he didn't know anything, he didn't sort of elaborate, elab, excuse me, elaborate on it. Um, but there were some sort of um, red lights. For example, he had um, this car um, which had this sort of strange um, um, back um, plate on the car and it said Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit, and it, had a, it said Wash DC. And, and I looked at this, and I was like, you know, what the hell's all this about? Now, the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit actually was um, a short-lived program of the U.S. government, of the U.S. military, actually, the Army, 
um, in the 50s. That was that was legit, but either it shut down or it was sort of absorbed into a, a sort of more secret organisation. We don't know. But at some point after the 50s, nobody can find any more documents on the interplanetary phenomenon unit. And mm. Salter said to me, um, he was given the like the back license plate of that vehicle, and you can see the license plate in the in the car, in the uh, photograph um, section in the book. And um, and I was thinking, well, you know, would would a secret agency would give this old guy on retirement, you know, a license plate for the cars that were always left, you know, inside the you know, the confines of the um, the facility. You know, it seemed a bit over, to, over the top of it. But also, I could clearly see that he was trying to drive me towards it and to see if I was impressed by it, which I particularly wasn't impressed by it. I was just... Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's... It, this way it kind of got intriguing, but also sort of um, frustrating because in one sense, he... He had an extra, although he didn't tell the story about Battelle, um, he did and was able to, you know, um, talk about all this, a lot of the minutiae and all sorts of different things of Marilyn in, in relation to Battelle. And um, so that was an important thing. But on the other hand, you know, there was a degree of almost, like, almost like a Walter Mitty type aspect to him, you know, this um, guy who may you know, wanted to present him as something that he actually wasn't. Um, but he did have a military background, and it was a good, solid, uh, you know, he did a lot of work in the Air Force. Um, and so, like a lot of this story, you know, some of it is really weird and strange, and you have to think, well, you know, is this guy sort of, you know, screw me over? Um, is he, you know, is he good? Is there some kind of agenda that he's got on his mind um is he being asked to say this to push me down a different pathway or something um but yeah it was it was really kind of strange you know sort of driving around taos with this old guy with this um big license plate saying interplanetary phenomenon you know mm -hmm. <laughs> and but what was interesting was that we were driving around town and we suddenly got um pulled down by the cops and um, so they pulled us over and um, the cop got out and the two of them were talking. And, um, and and what intrigued me, I mean, you may know better than me being American, um, but the license plate was on, on both licenses, front and back. And, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I, I, I don't think, you know, when you have these sort of fancy mm -hmm. plates and whatever, I'm not sure you you can have it on the back and front, can you? I'm not sure. I think it depends oh, yeah. on the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, but can you have it on both front and back? Yeah. Prob yes, Prob you can. Yeah. yeah. So, because certain yeah, states, okay. certain. I I I'm from Illinois originally, and you had to have a front and back plate, and it would be the same issued the same way. Yeah. Okay. There is as well. Well, that that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. Well, one of the interesting things. Uh, you know, uh, he had this plate and, um, you know, this cop, the cop sort of waved him down and they were chatting and I was sort of just sitting there and then they'd sort of look over a couple of times at me and, and it was really weird kind of surreal situation, you know, and, um, I, you know, we've just been talking all about this, about Patel and the documents and all this business and Marilyn's death and we get pulled over and then the two of them are just sort of like eagle eyeing me while I'm sitting in the front of the car, just <laughs> <laughs> what's going on, you know, but, but, it was, but it did make for like, I knew reading it, you know, as I was doing it, uh, going along, it, you know, it made for an interesting story, but it equally, um, you know, sort of complicated things even further. And that's, that's one of the problems if I, have, I have to admit with the story, because the story itself goes back to the sixties you know, obviously, even if somebody was in their twenties then and knew much and knew about it, like, um, like for example, um, you know, somebody may have known about this. I mean, today they'd be pushing eighty, if not in their eighties, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. now. So, you know, trying to find 
people who are definitely around and also willing to talk. I mean, you know, that's kind of a stretch really today. Yeah. I mean, but you know, sometimes people don't want to keep the secrets to the grave. So it could be mm. prime time to yeah. go knocking on some senior living facilities and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. get the final yeah. scoop. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> But um, what I thought was also interesting is with the book, you, you talk a great deal and you, you have recently talked about it on the show tonight about the hoaxing fake documents mm -hmm. and you've got a chapter around the majestic 12 and, and you know, I, I don't want to say like this Tim good guy was faking stuff or you mentioned another gentleman named Moore, but it seems like there was a reexamination of majestic 12. So for the, Listeners out there, what is Majestic 12 and why is it so important? Well, uh, it depends who you ask. I mean, Stan Friedman, the late Stan Friedman, me and Stan were, were good friends. But when it came to the, the Majestic 12 documents, you know, we were like cats and dogs. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the Majestic 12 documents have a, have a sort of a deep parallel to the Marilyn documents because the documents... Where you got the Marilyn documents is a one-page thing. Um, Stan and Bill Moore, who was um, like a, a colleague and friend with them, when they were when they got these again leaked, alleged leaked documents, they took um, you know took a, a far greater um, part of the story because um, you know dozens of pages were starting to surface from supposedly this super secret government called Majestic 12 in the government, which was responsible for hiding the, the dead bodies from Roswell and the craft and um, trying to re-engineer, um, you know, the, the technology, this kind of thing. Now, you mentioned Tim, uh, Tim Good. Tim, Tim wasn't a person who sort of, you know, hoaxed anything, but he, the documents that he was given may have been hoaxed. And... Now, Stan, Stan Friedman, to his dying day, would not um, believe that those documents were fakes. And mm. I thought they were fakes. Um, so, again, you've got another example of mysterious documents being handed over by equally mysterious, shadowy people, whistleblowers late at night, you know, at the end of the road, take this envelope, you know, that, that's <laughs> literally what it was like. Um, and the, so the MJ-12 documents, Majestic 12 documents, were a sort of precursor to um, the Marilyn documents, but essentially an expanded version I mean, Marilyn isn't mentioned in the MJ-12 documents, but it's it's basically a, a, the scenario is the same. People on the inside trying to get leaked documents out so the rest of the world would finally know the truth. Or were the documents put together by a government agency as a means to try and um, push us down right. a different avenue, mm -hmm. which might turn out to be a fake, and then it looks like the whole thing's garbage, and everybody, you know, gets depressed. You know, that could have been the, you know, the idea as well to try and uh, sort of um, for the UFO community for us to get our hopes up, and then, you know, then slam us back to the ground, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but Majestic Twelve pretty much does parallel, you know, the story of Marilyn with the leaked documents and and the stories of dead bodies and, and craft and whatever, you know. Yeah. So one of the things that makes me wonder, because it, you know, we've got, if I could talk, right, we, we've had a, <laughs> a lot of somewhat, you know, shady documents here and we're at a period too where you had written about this before nick where the soviets were trying to create a ufo panic and we all know how good the russians are at misinformation and disinformation did you find any kind of crossover in your research for this book concerning it's around the same time i mean it's all height of the cold war and something that oh, yeah. potentially yeah. could have been planted by the soviets or russian at the time soviets um cool. It, that well, yeah, fed I into mean, this. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting theories, um, I don't personally buy into it, but it is a fascinating and alternative story. And, and what it is, the theory is that the Soviets at the height of the Cold War, that they created the Marilyn document. Oh. And then, and, and you know, you might think, well, why on earth would the Russians set up, you know, create a faked CIA document about the death of, Marilyn Monroe in relation to UFOs. You know, why would the Russians do that? And the one theory that was put forward was that um, the document at some point would be released by the Russians to the US. And the reason, supposedly, would be to basically say, look at America, you know, what terrible they must people, they must, you know, what terrible people they must be if they would kill their the, you know their beloved Marilyn Monroe you know mm-hmm. that kind that was the one scenario you know uh, if Amer- if America would kill Marilyn they'd kill anyone that that's basically what the the theory was put forward as to why the Soviets might create a document like that and it was and if it was true you know it was it was done to try and make America looked bad when in re- in reality the the documents of the death had nothing to do you know with the u s that you know they're talking about actually being done by the russians um so you know you've got when it comes to things like psychological warfare like that you know with the Russians creating stories to try and make America look bad and 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 you see things now you know today <laughs> i mean all the stress we've got going down with the Russians, you know, yeah. right now with Putin. And I mean, you know, they're always sort of playing games, mind games and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, now, of course, you know, there are other theories as well. I mean, you've got like the classic scenario of some kid, you know, um, in his mom and dad's basement and, you know, <laughs> gets his hands on a piece of paper or something. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, but, but the interesting thing is, you know, if somebody decided to hoax the field of ufology in 1995, which is when the document was found, you know, why is it that no, in the 25 years that's gone by, why has no one ever come forward and said, gotcha, you know, you're all a bunch of, you know, idiots for believing this for all that amount of time? <laughs> right. <You know>? right. <laughs> that could be the person getting arguably, close to their I deathbed. Guess, <laughs> well, yeah. But... Um, But, you know, the interesting thing is nobody ever came forward to say, you know, I was the person who made the documents and and here's Mm -hmm. the paperwork and here's all the photographs that I took as I was going along, you know, and um, making the document together. That never happened. Nobody, um, apart from me, uh, and there's a guy named Don Burleson. Don, in 2001, wrote a little book uh, like a pamphlet type book mm-hmm. um, about the um, the story of, of the Marilyn documents, um, and apart from da- um, apart from Don's um, book itself, um, and my book now, which is you know in 2021, so we talk about years after 1995. Apart from that, um, there's just been a few articles here and there, maybe about 10 or 15 of that period. Um, and one um, documentary put together, which you can um, watch on on TV. On um, T, I think it's on um, Netflix, maybe, but it's definitely online anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, right, right. And yeah, and um, and if you so, if you look at it, you know, not much has been done with it. Nobody has come forward to say it was a hoax. Um, and so again, you know, you've got this question of of why what's the motivation and it and it really is difficult to find you know a legitimate reason to do this because because there really is no point if there's not going to be a kind of you know an end for a reason you know what well, but one thing i would tell you is that um the the MJ-12, the Majestic 12 documents, and I talk about this in the, the book as well, the Majestic mm-hmm. 12 documents that we're talking about earlier um, or just now, um, one of the interesting things is that the FBI, they went looking at the, the Majestic 12 documents because they wondered if they actually were 
real leaked documents and there really had been a UFO crash at Roswell. The FBI actually wondered about that. And um, But what's really interesting is that the FBI's, the title of the FBI's file that they put together, Our Majestic 12, is an interesting one because you'd imagine the FBI would have titled it something like questionable document majestic mm. 12 you know or possibly leaked documents but mm-hmm. it wasn't the 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 fbi's file on majestic 12 is actually titled espionage and that do, just that one oh. word and the title suggests there was some kind of like an espionage type thing and america was sort of thinking well is this the russian doing it to us or you know, is it vice versa that we're using espionage to say what the Russians think about the Majestic 12 documents? You know, there's so many um, twists and turns that, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to say. But when you've got an FBI file on UFOs titled espionage, you can be 100 percent sure there's a bigger picture that we still haven't seen mm-hmm. yet. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Totally. Um so since we're on the subject of UFOs, I do have to ask, because June 25th is the release of the Pentagon's UFO files. I, um, you know, they'll be declassified and published. Some of the stuff has already leaked. You know, if you've been watching the news, yeah. they've covered it. So, mm-hmm. Nick, what's your take on it? Do you think they'll actually release some good, juicy stuff out of it? Um, um. I hate to say this and be a spoil sport, but <laughs> <We got it. laughs> um, knowing how government um, personnel operate versus how those of us in the UFO field, you know, I think we're going to see what you get in most um, government reports. And that's a lot of, you know, bureaucratic data, a very careful statements, you mm-hmm. know, um, I don't think, you know, we're going to get a report that says, you know, we think, um, you know, we we suspect that, you know, the UFOs have flown by seven foot tall reptilians. They're going to kill us all. You know, <laughs> we're not going to get anything over the top like that. I think we're going to get more of what we've already got. And that would be um, the idea of... Um, maybe some kind of technology, um, classified aircraft that we've been flying, or that possibly, as we've heard also, you know, maybe the Chinese mm-hmm. or the Russians have, you know, have been doing something with hypersonics and things like this. And um, I, I, I think they will stay away from the extraterrestrial angle, primarily because that's what they've really done right up until now. And mm-hmm. it would look even more controversial if at the last moment with the new report comes out and they say, oh, well, we, you know, we've decided now it wasn't the Russians, it wasn't the Chinese, we think it could now be aliens. Uh, I have a hard time thinking that at the last moment, you know, next week, whatever it is, um, I would be surprised if they change their approach. I don't think they'll change their approach, but I think they will probably release more sort of enlightening and intriguing data that gives us more questions. Um, but, you know, I mean, I don't think, you know, this, an old, you know, um, an old side of, um, you know, we're going to see like Marilyn's diary come popped out, you know, <laughs> or anything like that. Oh, man. <laughs> the last thing last thing she put is i took some pills and drank some wine and then these little green men knocked on the door <laughs> <laughs> yeah but um but yeah i don't think uh i i mean i'm not being pessimistic or negative i'm just now a way you know a lot of these government um agencies operate mm-hmm. And if they've made a specific statement, you know, and we're seeing all this like on CNN, everybody mm-hmm. else right now, and, and the government's saying, you know, saying this, saying that, um, I think we're just going to see more of what we've seen already. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe we're going to see more pictures, maybe we can see more imagery, gun camera footage, that kind of thing, probably more documents. And I think there probably will be 
maybe some speculative documents about or how on earth are these things flying mm -hmm. and you know are do is anybody on the planet able to do that uh, i think okay. those are the questions i'll be asking but um beyond that i i would be surprised if you know there's some really sensational so i think it'll be fascinating because we won't have seen anything like this for a very 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 long time mm -hmm. um but but i mean i'll be very pleased if i'm wrong you know <laughs> right right that i i had okay i watched some of the project blue book series just because it kind of it kind of drug me in but i i wanted to ask things like you know they it, it, there were reports that you know the these unidentified crafts were going along at possibly two three thousand miles an hour how did that not create a sonic boom i mean or or how was that measured mm -hmm. just there were so many questions and i know it was all based on um loosely well, written down things but <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I can't sort of definitively, you know, answer that question. But one of the things I can say is that you remember back in 1989 when the um, the stealth bomber and the stealth fighter were, were sort of reeled mm -hmm. out the hangar, you know, this okay. weird looking triangular, the small one, the flight, uh, mm -hmm. the, the fighter, you know, this um, triangular thing, the, you know, the, the stealth fighter. And then you got the bigger black triangle on the um you know the, the stealth bomber everybody saw them you know when they came out in 1989 everybody's like holy hell what's that you know right <laughs> and, um, <laughs> now what's intriguing those were reeled out of the hangars for everybody to see in 1989 however the technology and the designs for both planes the, the stealth fighter and the bomber were were being tested uh, out at area 51 as early as 1975. So they were starting on it in 75 and didn't rule it out for another 14 years. Mm -hmm. So in other words, what we're seeing now could have been developed 14 years ago in that situation, you know, um, and we aren't, we don't realize, you know, that the government's 14 years ahead of us. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. There may well be technology developed a long time ago just like it with the stealth fighter, stealth bomber, and you know that the government developed or the military uh, developed something that has been on the, you know, the the secret um, situation mm -hmm. um, for 13, 14 years, and um, and everybody else doesn't realise the government is so far ahead of the rest of us. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, one important thing to note is that government agencies don't always share each other uh, the data what they've got. You know, the right. CIA doesn't always work with the NSA and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, when we say the government doesn't know what's going on, well, the one arm of the government may know, but another one may not know because that other agency doesn't have the clearance to mm -hmm. know. It sounds strange, but government agencies do keep data from other government agencies mm -hmm. so when the government says or a an office you know the one that's going to give us the report says we've looked and looked and we don't think this is anything to do with us there could be two or three other agencies you know we're looking the tv you know when the story breaks saying um well you know we know guys even though you don't you know so mm -hmm. um when people say the government it's not like one just one body, you know, the government is made up of multiple agencies that don't always work together, have good reason sometimes not to work together and not to share their mm -hmm. secrets. So, um, no. so again, it becomes very difficult under all those circumstances. But I, but like I said, to, to get back to, you know, what I, what it boils down to, I think we'll see more of what we've already seen and a very careful bureaucratic kind of, report which mm -hmm. tries to avoid sensationalizing things but um but you know if it's got a little great gray creature with black eyes on the front cover <laughs> of the report i mean that might actually be a bit more <laughs> sort would, of um 
you know, get a show Ooh. of people. Or, wow, or, you know. <laughs> or they put the X-Files poster at Mulder's, the I want to believe yeah, exactly. with the saucer and X. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. so, but in, in regard to the technology, so just to give some context, when I so I was a code breaker in the military and I had very yeah. specific targets. Only the people that sat in my bay knew about it. Mm. No, even yep. though I'm surrounded by a bunch of other people doing a lot of similar things, never talked about it, never yeah. shared. That was mm-hmm. all you did. Yeah. Of course, the people that worked on the same targets, yeah, of course, you can, you know, you would share between yeah. each other. Well, and yeah, different I mean, military like classic, forces. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of like the classic scenario of need mm-hmm. to know. And if you don't yeah. need to know, you don't know because mm-hmm. that's how secrets are kept, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The less people are in the know, um, the, the bigger the chance is that you're not things aren't going to leak out. Mm-hmm. If everybody and his brother and his mother-in-law knows about it, well, of course the story is <laughs> going to come out. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. loose lips oh. sink. Not that I have against yeah. anything against mother-in-laws, but. <laughs> <laughs> However, Nick will be taking any top secret secrets you may have. Just call. Right. Uh, there you go. <laughs> but in regards, also with the tech, though, I do want to to bring this up. I thought this was kind of interesting um, and I would be very happy if they did, if they released videos with the documents, cause you know, they can write stuff up, but I'm sure they have just a portfolio of UFO and USO. Cause let's remember USOs could be part of this. I'm a big fan of USOs myself, but um, you know, when we talk about the tech um, let's just take Hyperloop, for example. I always bring this up because, uh, Nick, before we started the show, we c- talked about the TikTok thing off Catalina Island. Mm. I mean, we do have technology that allows us to create frictionless surfaces. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it could be, for all we know, it could have just been a simple commercial test mm. of... You know, there's another angle that, I, that I've, you don't hear much about, but it makes me kind of wonder, um, is that you know, um, that we get to see the pictures, you know, we get to see the footage and everything else. And, and the government comes forward and says, actually, it was us, you know, we've been able to confirm Mm -hmm. that we've been working on some radical things. And, um, and it really was us, not aliens. And by doing that, you'll, you know, people will be kind of like, Oh, well, what a letdown. Let's go just go back and watch TV and whatever. Let me go, and let what me go that fly could my drone. Do, mm-hmm. well, that, what that could do, that could actually cause people to become kind of, you know, sort of fed up and um, disgruntled and, you know, oh, wasn't it aliens after all? When it may actually have been, but by presenting it as a, as a terrestrial technology, mm-hmm. um, People feel, you know, sort of, um, why do, why are we still bothering doing this? You know, kind of, okay. you know, making people feel, mm-hmm. why do I bother? And they walk away. And that could actually be the scenario to try and have you, the people in ufology, you know, really excited, waiting for the report to come out, and then it crushes them. Yeah. Um, that could, you know, that's a, a good sort of psychological approach from their perspective, <laughs> but, but not from ours. Yeah, I was going to say, um, speaking of the MJ-12 files, Brian Dunning, who's a, a skeptic, uh, he did research into that, and it, the government came out and said that MJ-12 was actually a misinformation or disinformation campaign from the U.S. government to take attention away from their Air Force secret military projects. Oh, so yeah, that, that. Again, you know... A lot of people don't realize that ufology and the subject and the phenomenon isn't just the phenomenon. It's also the way in which this, you know, there's no doubt in my mind, you know, there's a real genuine UFO phenomenon. Now, whether it's extraterrestrial, multidimensional time travelers, I have no idea. But there is a real genuine UFO phenomenon. But that real phenomenon has been manipulated by intelligence agencies Uh to use it for various reasons. And that's one of the important things. You haven't just got the UFO subject and the phenomenon. You've got the manipulators who are doing it for their own, for their own ends, you know? And Mm -hmm. so 
that's where it gets complicated when you've got a real phenomenon and somebody's actually altering the history and the the nature of what it's perceived to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're moving into the second hour and we have uh, listener <laughs> questions to ask, which I will defer to Wendy in a moment, but I just want to give you one last plug. So Diary of Secrets, UFO Conspiracies and the Mysterious Death of Marilyn Monroe by Nick Redfern, available in, as Kindle and paperback from Lisa Hagen Books. Lisa Hagen Books came out in May 2021. Make sure you get a copy. And now it's kind of time to change up the subject. So, Wendy, <laughs> I'll hand it over to you. Well, the, yeah. since we're in the second hour. Since we're in the second hour, yes. Um, a question from Jeremy Hinton of Cold Spotters in Kentucky. Um, he heard and believed that Bigfoot bury their dead like Native Americans do. Um, Nick, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I've actually got a big interest in the whole Bigfoot phenomenon and um, mm-hmm. written a couple of books on the subject and uh, been on various expeditions um, over the, the years. And, um, and you know, there's a lot of weird stuff in relation to um, Bigfoot. I mean, um, a lot of people in the field of cryptozoology, uh, which is kind of like the like a lofty title for what I just like to call monster hunters i'd rather be called a mon- i'd rather be called a monster hunter than a cryptozoologist you know? <laughs> yeah. and, um, i just i just like why don't you call it what it is dude you know <laughs> that's what we do you know? i'll be pc apparently <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah i don't either but <laughs> But uh, but anyway, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff about the Bigfoot phenomenon where people claim to have seen these creatures in front of them and they've sort of vanished in a flash of an eye. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people have been driving down the street late at night and, you know, again, it sort of literally dis- and, uh, you know, disappears in front of them. A lot of reports of strange lights in the sky seen at the same location at time. Uh, that Bigfoot has been seen, and um, and even people claim to have been sort of received almost like telepathic messages from these creatures. So, you know, if you put all these weird aspects to the, the phenomenon, which I do, but a lot of cryptozoologists do kind of avoid that side of it. But for me, I think there's much more to Bigfoot than, than meets the eye. I don't think it's, these creatures are just a North American equivalent of a like an African gorilla. I don't think that's what they they are. I think there's something paranormal connected to them, but okay. uh, and that may explain um, the you know in relation to the the question. Was it Jeremy? Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yeah, it was. Yeah, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Jeremy's question is an important one because mm-hmm. you know these creatures are like seven to eight feet tall. And we can't find one of them. You know, right. mm-hmm. there's something right. wrong somewhere, and and that may relate to you know the idea of burying the bodies. But also, you know, some researchers think they could sort of uh, flit in and out of our reality in what the the concept of what are known as wormholes. You mm-hmm. know, the idea that these things are not sort of. Um, you know, just animals. Um, Well, I shouldn't really say just animals. You know, animals are highly intelligent as well. But but what I mean is that, um, you know, they may be highly advanced even more than us. And maybe Mm -hmm. the reason why they elusive, um, you know, they're so elusive and we never catch one ever. And we should do, considering, you know, the amount of people in the US and these things are like eight feet tall. We should have at least one. You know, the fact that we don't yes. tells us that, um, you know, either bodies, like Jeremy said, could be buried, which isn't impossible. Um, mm-hmm. But I also think there could be something, you know, the, the idea of these creatures based on some of the stories of um, of these things zipping in and out of our reality to a very different reality, if you like. Mm-hmm. But- Interdimensional travelers. Mm mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So this brings up the question then, if it seems that um, Bigfoot does have these abilities, 
it makes me think they're actually aliens. So why wouldn't the monster hunters be applying some, you know, ufology type, let's find the little green men stuff to looking for Bigfoot? Like, but they are. Well, I mean, I mean, I just watch the shows on this stuff, and I just well, see yeah. them making, you know, the gorilla sounds, the hollers, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and picking up some scat on the, you know. But wouldn't there be some sort of energy imprint that's different around a Bigfoot then if it has abilities like that? Well, I mean, it's difficult to say because, you know, we've never sort of caught one of these things. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got pictures, we've got footage. Um and that's really, and we've got testimony, which is all important. But on the other hand, you know, I mean, like I said, I mean, you know, there's like roughly, I think, around about 330 million people in the U.S., something mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, if if Bigfoot was like the size of a mouse, I can understand why we would never find mm -hmm. them, you know, if they mm -hmm. were able to hide in the woods. But we're talking about them being seen in every state apart from Hawaii, all over the place, um, but uh, we can't find them, we can't catch them. They have this odd, weird ability to elude us and, and be gone in, in a moment. You know, um, what are the chances of any other animal at a height of seven to eight feet tall all across the country, never get hit by cars or a truck, um, mm -hmm. never die at the edge of the road or in the woods and get mm -hmm. found? You know, no other animals, uh, you know, most people don't see like a mountain lion right in front of them ever. Most people mm -hmm. don't. Most people mm -hmm. don't see like a black jaguar or whatever um, or a grizzly bear. But, you, but people do. Mm -hmm. And they do sometimes, unfortunately, get hit by vehicles or get shot by hunters. Um, but um, that doesn't happen with Bigfoot. Bigfoot eludes us uh, every time. Good. Of it on every occasion and mm -hmm. there's something about that that is impossible when it comes you know the idea of not catching one getting one mm -hmm. it, it's it's just not feasible so there has to be something from my mind that um makes it far beyond just mm -hmm. a you know, an equivalent of a gorilla. However, for for whatever reason a lot of cryptozoologists don't like to import the sort of um, paranormal into it mm -hmm. i don't understand why they have an issue with it i mean i would just i just want to know the answers i don't care if they are mm -hmm. just unknown apes or they're mm -hmm. something paranormal or something extraterrestrial i just want to know um you know <laughs> yeah we do have a comment um from chandler in the comments i don't know wendy if you want to take it because i flapped my gums a lot this episode Oh, um, let me let me get to that part. Um, all right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, Scott, um, people claim to receive telepathic messages. Would it be possible that they have similar methods that just block them from being perceived? Like a cloaking or ability. Telepathy, to, telepathic right. ability to, mm -hmm. to uh, or, cancel themselves out of your senses. Bend the lights around them so you can't actually see them somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Or make a blind, yep. blind spot in your brain. I mean, if they're sending telepathic right, messages. Right. Professor X has done it in the X Men. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, there are some stories where people have seen the Bigfoot creatures vanish in front of them. And um, some people have seen them kind of like in, you know, the Predator movies where you've got mm -hmm. like this. Um, shimmering you know mm -hmm. that kind of blend mm -hmm. into the background mm -hmm. that kind of thing um but what you know any aspect along those lines it only needs one of these weird aspects to to demonstrate they're not just apes you know right um, so um, um so I, th I, I you know i'm one of these people who um you know monster hunting is one of my you know cryptozoologists one of my biggest sort of um thing i enjoy doing you know i, I mm -hmm. like going out on road mm -hmm. on road trips and things like that and yeah, expeditions um but a lot of my friends in the field you know we're all good friends but we we disagree you know um i think they're not just flesh and blood animals i think like the dog man and things mm -hmm. like that and moth man to me they're clearly 
extraterrestrial, paranormal, supernatural, occult. Um, mm -hmm. But then they're everything but um, just unknown animals. animals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Um, I, I don't know exactly what they are, but yeah, they're not of this world particularly. And I think people fear it. So they need them to be something they can explain away as animalistic or, or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Those are my thoughts. And there's also a crossover. You know, as I said, um, sometimes you see UFOs and straight light, strange lights in the sky where, mm -hmm. and at the same time, Bigfoot creatures have been seen. Um, another weird angle, like, for example, at Loch Ness, you know, another strange creature. Um, at Loch Ness, you know, there's been sightings of UFOs. Um, mm -hmm. There have been, um, yeah, I mean, you know, you've got UFO sightings at Loch Ness. Um, there's been at least three cases of men in black encounters at Loch Ness. And um, Alistair Crowley, the famous occultist, um, mm -hmm. he had a house um, overlooking Loch Ness called Beleskin House for a number of years uh, before he left. And... Um, and so you've got the paranormal, you've got the occult, and mm -hmm. a lot of weird stuff at Loch Ness, where you just happen to have these the stories of these weird so-called Nessies, you know, the Loch Ness monsters. So um, again, I kind of think put like the, the the Nessie story, Loch Ness monster story. I place that into you know kind of like a paranormal type situation as well. But uh, you know, some of my friends listening right now are probably rolling their eyes and uh, Nick's only one of his paranormal rants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, it could but be remember, a big foot aquarium. But but you draw but the line care, at ghosts, care. Nick. I know you draw the line at ghosts. <laughs> well, it's, not, <laughs> it's actually not that I draw the line, but as we probably discussed this before, but for yeah. people who haven't, it's not so much I I draw the line at ghosts. For whatever reason, I'm just not really interested in ghosts yeah, and haunted it. houses. It don't do anything for me, you know. And um, But for other people, you know, they can't do, you know, they have no interest in UFOs, but they're really, <laughs> you know, cool about haunted houses. But, uh, yeah, I just don't yeah. really have much of an interest in ghosts for some reason. So um, I'll let people who are interested to to deal with that. I mean, I mean, what's better, you know? <laughs> sort of investigating, um, you know, clanking chains and ghosts or or hanging out investigating Marilyn Monroe, you know. I mean, it's, it's right. not a, a hard thing for me to make a decision, you know. <laughs> I'll stay with Marilyn, you know. <laughs> I'm just like, what? There was a horrible slaughter in this house? Oh, my goodness. Let me get the EMF meter. <laughs> do live some dark history let me tell you <laughs> go ahead wendy looked like you had a lost question. it i did oh. i did it's okay well, so, <laughs> well, so, nick since we're we're in the cryptozoology part of it just so you know i will say though the longer i've been doing ghost hunting mm -hmm. actually when it comes to crossover i'm really starting to get into cryptozoology <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm really getting into monsters now and i think it's because i think that it's it seems more concrete than ghost stuff, like when you get evidence and how you look for the critters. Mm. Um, well, I mean, to some degree, you know, there are crossovers. There's no doubt about that, whether some people, you know, deny it or not. Um, and, and as I said, you know, with, I mean, you could make a case that a lot of these things, if not all of them, um, are interconnected. I mean, John Keel, you know, most famous for the Mothman Prophecies book, um, Keel came to believe that all of these weird phenomena were somehow interconnected, um, whether it was, you know, sort of life after death, um, cryptozoology, ufology, you know, the occult. He believed that somehow it was all tapped together somehow. And um, for whatever reason, you know, we still haven't resolved it. But, um, you know, I mean, and, and Keel actually did have some genuinely interesting theories and concepts, whether you bought into them or not. You know, he, he did make some cases, good cases, as to why we can never catch them, 
why they seem to be seen in the same places, but they're completely different creatures. You know, kind of like having Alistair Crowley at Loch Ness and this monster at Loch Ness, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, you know, for some reason, I just don't get it why a lot of people in these, um, the respective fields, you know, get really kind of defensive about all this. It's like... It's like chill out. It's a all we talk about is a monster. We're not talking about you know worrying about World War Three or whatever. I mean, it's... <laughs> right. <laughs> theory. We're talking mm-hmm. theory, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all. But yeah, I mean, I think most people do find though when you get into this, you know, you think, you know, you get into it maybe with UFOs. And then you kind of expand into this and then into that. And before you know it, you realize that you are caught in kind of like a situation which is combined of multiple different mysteries. Um, Mm -hmm. But like I said, I've never understood that the vehemence of, you know, sort of um, of people saying that Bigfoot just has to be an ape. Well, no, he doesn't, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it could be anything. You exactly. know, we barely, barely scratch the surface, really. Uh, yeah. Until we, till we get one, or at least some DNA. Well, if they uh-huh. have DNA. Right? Well, that's sure. the thing. But uh-huh. we should have it by now. I mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with all the sightings, the areas you think you'd get a tuft of fur. And on a twig. the most important thing of all, the fact they're like eight feet towering oh. monsters. <laughs> you know, know. I, I don't know. Know. I, yeah. sort of. I mean, they're not sneaking up on you. <laughs> no, but they are. But yet, yes, they are. <laughs> yeah, yet they are. Yet they mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. Um, so just on the subject of cryptozoology, because Nick, I see you have an, another book coming out in September. So we'll have to get a tease for that one. But mm-hmm. do you have any other plans for cryptozoology? I'm just going through. I'm just going through your portfolio of books here, and we Monster have a, 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 what's that? Monster hunting, Mister. Yeah, monster hunting. Um, <laughs> we haven't yeah, had a good hunting. monster book since Monsters of the Deep last year. Um, um, yeah. Well, I haven't got any plans directly right now for another cryptozoology book but i tend to mainly write the cryptozoology books the way i did it you know kind of like Mm -hmm. like in a journal style in a Mm -hmm. diarist uh, journal and the reason why i do that because you know i i think people like to sort of follow the story like that i mean Mm -hmm. a perfect example would be my uh, book chupacabra road trip which was based around all my expeditions around puerto rico um Mm -hmm looking for the the original chupacabras on Puerto Rico. And that one's sort of like a cross between, um, you know, like a, a monster hunt and fear and loathing in Las Vegas. It's sort of like, <laughs> um, it's like a crossover between hunting for monsters and, um, and getting utterly wasted on the way, you know, and having a good time. And um, mm-hmm. so that, that's basically what the book's about. But I think people like, you know, that kind of journal approach, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it's a dark and stormy night and we jumped into the, the Jeep and headed off for the chupacabras, the thunder and lightning crashed in the skies. You know, people <laughs> like that, that kind of angle, you know, when you're telling the story. And so when I'm writing a cryptozoology book, I mean, I could do them at any time where it's just about, you know, like a story about the creatures, but I much, I sort of much um, prefer to wait until I've got like a case where I can go on like a, a month long expedition or something mm-hmm. and yeah. then do a book on what happened in that four week period, you know, so but I'll do, I will do another because I enjoy going on, you know, the expeditions and things. And um, mm-hmm. so, uh, and yeah, so point. start doing that again a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. It's it's a lot like the Raiders of the Lost Star and mm. meet meet Bigfoot. <laughs> I like to call solo meet Bigfoot. Um. <laughs> but, but I think with Bigfoot, I mean, I'm not sure what. Unless we find one, I'm not sure we can find much more other than just keep 
collecting mm-hmm. reports. And I mean, and the point comes when you, you can only go far with just collecting reports and not getting any answers. You know, it's like with UFOs. It's okay. Somebody spent 50 years and they've got 2,000 reports, but they've got no answers. I mean, have they well, actually achieved anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I That's think... with, like with Bigfoot. We need... We don't need more and more reports. We need answers. I think we need to step outside the box on the detection type equipment and energy signatures to look beyond what we've already got. Um, I don't think they work on the same wavelength as as a as a mail meter or a, or something that Jake might like to use. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't <laughs> think that's that they've quite hit upon the correct frequency for them. Yeah. But that's me. What do you think, Nick? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, these are all sort of important things, you know, to sort of address and whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's like, but again, you know, how many answers have we actually got? And um, sadly, you know, (laughs) we we don't have many um, answers. You know, I mean, I'm People, some people don't want to say that because it sounds defeated, you know. Sort mm-hmm. of, you know, they're, they've defeated us, but it's not. You know, it just means you just got to keep pushing until mm-hmm. you get the answers. So. Yep, grind it out. Keep on yep. getting evidence. Yep. Because one day someone's going to get the video that shows like the little light flash signature thing, and then yeah. Bigfoot's gone. I mean, and they're the like, "Oh, he teleports." Is, okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the important thing is, it only takes one. Bigfoot body to prove the whole phenomenon. Yeah. You know, we don't need we don't need to cap. You know, I mean, I would hate it if you know somebody found one and proved it existed by killing it. I mean, that yeah. would be that would yeah. be a typical thing that the human race would do. Yep. You know, oh, they there's a Bigfoot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like somebody goes through the woods. There's a Bigfoot. Oh my God, shoot it! You know, yeah, um, mm, jerky. That's probably what. That probably is what it would take, but, uh, and that's probably what would happen, but that would be the most tragic, stupid, yeah. blundering mm-hmm. thing that the human race would do. So I would hope that, you know, that in a in a perfect situation, I would hope that we could, you know, bearing in mind the fact that they could be supernatural, you know, rather mm-hmm. than flesh and blood, but if mm-hmm. if somebody did catch one and and shot it. I would hope they did it with like an anesthetic, um, clipped off a bunch of hair, hair some blood, um, maybe a, you know, clipper, fingernail, that kind of thing, have all the DNA, and then just get back to wherever you were. Don't tell anybody else where you found all this, and just let the animal then to wake up thinking, what the hell happened to me, you know? <laughs> and, um, oh, and then let, it, let it, he or she yeah. go. And we've got all the DNA and everything else, and we can hopefully come together with a a full, complete uh, analysis of what it looks like they were. You know, maybe some kind of ape, or possibly some sort of early primitive human, like sim- mm-hmm. similar to like Neanderthal man or Crow Magnon, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, but you know, a bit like I said, being the good own. A uh, good old uh, human race, you know. Somebody will probably <laughs> blast the thing, and, yeah. um, which would be pathetic, really. You know? mm-hmm. Because you don't know if that portal's going to open up and then the Bigfoot planet comes through. <laughs> well, it might be like, you know, um, that um, Twilight Zone thing, what was yeah. it, uh, to, to serve man, you know, that'll be, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. where uh, that, that would be like, well, that's your own fault for... Yeah, getting involved and trying to shoot, you know, the mm-hmm. relatives of this Bigfoot. What do you expect? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, the the one thing that I do appreciate, um, and this is more when you hear from, you know, I'll, I'll call it the more normal science cryptozoo. We'll say the cryptozoologists versus the monsters hunters. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of conservation involved with that side mm-hmm. of it. You know, yeah. protect the environment yeah. where these critters mm-hmm. should yeah. be, and and you know, we can all appreciate that. Um, I do need to ask a question from the chat. Okay. 
And that is from Brenda Hightower Berger. And she's asking, do you have anything on Skinwalker Ranch? Um, well, I've never actually been on the ranch itself, Brenda. Um, but I have been on a, a number of um, Skinwalker um uh, road trips and things like that. I did a TV shoot about 10 or 12 years ago um, and went out to um, actually not too far from the ranch itself and also out at Joshua Tree in California where, and this is why we actually did the filming there because there have been some reports uh, from some of the Native American people that lived in the area of Joshua Tree at the time. And... Um, and so the the show was basically put together hastily because this was like a, a big new story, and I went out there and um, and got to speak um, with a lot of um, Native American people who lived out there, and um, and they um, shared some fascinating data and information, you know, and their belief systems of their ability to sort of shape shift and possibly even like we were talking about with Bigfoot, you know, sort of jumping into different dimensions and um, wormholes and that kind of thing. But what was intriguing was that a lot of the people I interviewed when, you know, the, the crew was filming, well, filming while I was, you know, um, interviewing the people, a lot of them would not even say that word, would, would hmm. use the word skinwalker. Um, they felt just by saying it was dangerous and um and i guess more than any other that was the one creature that all the case i've looked into um that the people who'd seen them were really f fearful you know in a state right. of fear right. you know a lot of people with bigfoot yeah they were you know they were scared or you know amazed but with the skinwalkers it's always been a state of like complete terror and fear and also a kind of like a, a sense of um like an evilness you know mm -hmm. sort of uh, almost kind of you know sort of sweating out of the creature you know and you mm -hmm. could just feel the the terror kind of thing um and um so that that's probably the the closest um but a good friend of mine, um, Erica Lukes, um, I see quite often. Erica uh, has done a lot of research into the whole Skinwalker Ranch as well. And at places like the Skinwalker Ranch, actually, you can find them all around the world. You know, they, um, you know, people kind of give them different names. You know, sort of, um, you know, sort of hot spots, things like that, and. Mm -hmm. um, and and all around the world, you can find places where there'll be like a cluster of different mysteries, as if as if there really are sort of portals in different dotted around different parts of the world. Um, the Skinwalker Ranch is one. Uh, where I grew up in central England, a large area of forest called the Cannock Chase, um, that had and still has a lot of weird, multiple different types of mysteries all in that same area so you know those kind of hot spots supernatural hot spots are everywhere and um but yeah the, the skinwalker ranch story uh, or the events you know is is one of the the biggest ones i would say thank you for that so um when yeah, no do, you have, do you have a question uh i i had a, an addendum to brenda's uh there was a there was a huge storm up here in kansas city at a little bit north of it on Friday night. And um, Brenda's nephew, I believe it is, um, filmed and witnessed what was vaguely like that, the Elon Musk uh, satellite deal, mm. except they weren't, they were chasing a storm and they, their, their uh, movements were out of sync with anything that the, the Musk satellites had been um, mm. said or, or recorded doing before. That was, uh, and it's uh, Excelsior Springs, Missouri. Um, I saw the video of, of the few bites that the, that the guy was able to, to take. And it was, um, it was weird. It was a weird happening. But I know she'd want me to mention that. So I did. <laughs> <laughs> cool. 
Yeah, um, they were moving in right angles and, you know, going in different lines of threes and things. And then after a, just a short distance, they just kind of poofed out of existence. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So either either the nephew was heavily into the moonshine that night or... <laughs> But apparently this happens up in this area quite often. So it's, okay. you know, the, the healing waters of Excelsior Springs or who knows. It, there don't appear to be any major ley lines running through there from what I've been able to ascertain. Mm -hmm. well, <clears throat> thank you, Brenda, for that story. Thank you, Wendy. For yeah, thank you. Giving sure. Us, yeah. sure. Um, ch quick change of subject because we're in the final half hour. Nick, you have a new book coming out in September. I have to get on the the Nick Redfern publishing like newsletter, so I'm aware of these things. <laughs> uh, you've got time travel, the science and science fiction coming out on September first. Can we get some Ooh. scoop on that? Well, yeah, that, yeah, sure. Uh, the book comes out in September, and um, it's a book on time travel, and so the title is the time travel book. <laughs> that's, uh, that's an easy one. Yeah, you know, it's an easy one to remember, <laughs> and um, and it's sort of like a, an A to Z on everything to do with time travel. So it covers, um, you know, how, for example, um, the world of fiction, whether in novels or TV shows or movies, you know, how they've sort of um, inspired uh, or given sort of the image of what time travel might be like, but also, you know, things like. Um, people who claim to be time travelers um also stories you know where people have taken photographs of what are perceived to be time travelers sort of hiding in the crowds that kind of thing and also you know the the angle of what a lot of people perhaps don't always tie in with time travel is you know when people have sort of prophetic dreams you know mm -hmm. one night they have a really weird dream and then you know um two days later something happens that is identical to what they dreamed about oh, two uh -huh. days earlier. You know, that kind of situation. A lot of people at least once or twice in their life has done that. And in many respects, you know, that is defined as time travel. You've seen something um, two days before it actually happened. Um, that I, I had two experiences that uh, along those lines, um, over the years and it was just once or twice well it's twice actually and it was nothing amazing or sensational or anything at all um but it was there's no doubt in my mind i had this dream and then what happened about six months later um that, that I, I immediately i realized that i'd sort of had um you know the, it was exactly what i dreamed six months earlier um and so there's things like that in there. And also, you know, I've sort of diversed a little bit because, you know, people don't just want the same old thing. So I've got a section in there um, on doppelgangers, you know, um, the idea that we've all got, you know, sort of our mirror images somewhere in the world. But, it's, but there's a theory that doppelgangers could actually be, you know, yourself suddenly breaking through from their timeline to our timeline you know not realizing it's not somebody who looks like you it's actually you in a different mm -hmm. time zone you know so um so i've tried to sort of theory. you know make it not like just like the average time travel book you know i've sort of uh dug into all the various theories and reasons you know and um and prof like I said, prophetic dreams and nightmares and how that could happen, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, you know, um, looking at some of the classic movies like, you know, The Terminator and oh, um, Planet of the Apes and uh, The Time Machine, all those. Because, I mean, a lot of, you know, um, pop culture definitely does, you know, sort of influence um, how we sort of perceive you know, sort of long-term mysteries, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that should be out in September, and uh, it'll be out in uh, softback and hardback. So. Oh, good. Good deal. I'm dropping the link so everyone can pre-order. One moment. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm Jake, lot, king of plugs. Of, that's right. 
<laughs> a lot of uh, quantum physics involved in that. I get a little lost with those. Okay. So, um, Nick, next question uh, I have for you, and I've always, this is just something I've always been curious. You write a lot for Myster Mysterious Universe. Um, how did that come to be? And I mean, you publish pretty often. So do you find more freedom in writing in an online space instead of like on deadline for a book release? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of these things where I like, you know, people think, you know, what I do, I do this like 24 seven when I, I actually don't, I, I like to sort of be structured. What I do, I like to sort of work nine to five, Monday to Friday. And that's it. I never work evenings. Um, I never work at weekends. Um, and I just do nine to five, Monday to Friday, and I'll take a, a lunch break. Um, and you know, when the day's over, um, Unless it's like tonight, you know, like we're doing radio or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. five o'clock, my uh, laptop goes into sleep mode at five o'clock. I don't touch it till uh, eight o'clock the next morning. Um, I um, Facebook goes off, Twitter goes off. I, I just don't do nothing other than having a good time, you know. <laughs> um, and, I, and I like to sort of separate, you know, the two. Um because I think if I were to do this sort of 24-7, I'd be burned out, you know. Um, I'd, be, I'd be totally fried. That's why I like to, you know, like I said, have a, a regular social life, uh, weekends off, evenings off. And then, you know, I, I like to sort of keep, you know, work time um, hours. Now, I wouldn't want people to think that what I do is just a job. You know, it isn't. I, what I did was to turn a passion into a career um mm -hmm. in terms of writing but you know i do it because primarily because i still have the enthusiasm and the passion for all this that i did when i was like 15 you know mm -hmm. um or actually even when i would first went to uh, loch ness with my parents when i was like four or five and my dad told me the story of the loch ness monster you know that got me all excited you know jumping up in the air like a you know, little kid you know oh my god there's monsters in the waters dad you know mm -hmm. what are we going to do <laughs> um <laughs> that kind of thing um and i've never really Thank lost you. yeah i've never kind of lost that enthusiasm so you so you know that's the one angle the other one that you mentioned you know the issue of deadlines deadlines are what shall i call them one of the worst pains in the neck. Is <laughs> 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 and the publisher will say, you know, Nick, you know, this, the deadline's going to be like for the next book is going to be June the 10th. And I know I'm going to say, as I get closer, uh, I can't do it for June the 10th. It's going to have to be July the 15th. And they're like, Nick, why? <laughs> why? What have we done to you? You know, what have we done to you to... to, to... <laughs> So, you know, it's one of those things where you know, life steps in sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, you might have to go away to a conference. So you've already lost four days, you know, because it's a weekend conference, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, most um, publishers are OK with it. I mean, you know, most of them will give you like an extra sort of four or five weeks beyond the contractual agreement. Um but, I mean, obviously not they're going to give you, like, 18 months or anything <laughs> like that. Right, right. But, um, but, but, you know, five or six weeks, they're okay, you know. A little bit more, they might grumble a bit, but uh, we don't worry about that. <laughs> but, I mean, the one thing I was going to say with Mysterious Universe that I really like is it's kind of like um, us on the show tonight, you know. You're just mm -hmm. talking off the cuff. And when I read your stuff, like I'm looking at your article, uh, Mysterious Universe, on Bigfoot, Black Eyed Kids, Dogmen, Aliens, Are They All Tulpas? And you know, we kind of get the we get, you know, Nick's brain here. I mean, with a lot of the books, you're you're well, play, you're playing like straight up, you know, nonfiction. Here are the facts. Mm -hmm. You know, interpret yeah. as you will. And and this is like we're getting to see what's going on in Nick's head when I read Mysterious Universe. <laughs> Absolutely. 
Sometimes there's nothing going through it. <laughs> <laughs> Just drink more, something will happen. That noise, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, but actually, I, write, I like writing articles because sometimes I just like to do sort of like a, like a 900 or a 1,000 word article and, you know, sort of nail it down to what I think about one particular thing. You know, and, per, and you kind of get like the, like a, um, like a, a, a sort of a small version of what might actually be expanded one day into, you know, a, a book, that kind of situation. But, um, but yeah, I think people like to sort of sit down and read, you know, say a two or three page article and, um, and get something interesting out of it. Um, and it is just three pages or two pages and you don't have to, you know, get the whole story by digging through it for, you know, for six weeks or whatever. So. Mm-hmm. People like that kind of, it's right there in front of you and, you know, you get it done, you get mm-hmm. on to the next thing you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was going to say like magazine format, that's like my favorite, well, yeah. comic books. Yeah. Comic books are my favorite form of reading. <laughs> I've never really been into, um, you know, into um, comic books really. Oh, I'll send you a reading list, you'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess um I guess ghosts and comic books I've never really been into. And a lot of people kind of find it strange that I've never really been to ghosts and I've never really been into superhero stuff. But um but but again as a kid, I mean I, I can remember as a little kid, you know, right reading like Spider Man and stuff mm-hmm. but I can't remember beyond that. But um but you know, we all have our differences you know and uh, i mean you know for me um you know my i like me i'm into music and bands and all that kind of stuff and um mm-hmm. so you know we all have our we all have our own things i guess so. mm-hmm. yeah absolutely no worries with that now jake jake writes his own um he's got ghostly activities and he writes articles quite a bit like you um just the the shorter facts out there and it has to do with more supernatural than ghosty stuff quite often so everybody should check it out at least once oh well thank you for the plug <laughs> absolutely yeah that's drop the link in the chat or uh, whatever give it, okay. give it out loud <laughs> Yeah, so when I write for Ghostly, Nick, we we can talk craft here. <laughs> but when I write for Ghostly, um, you know, I wrote write like your thought leadership stuff like you just wrote with Tulpas uh, on Mysterious Universe. I, I do quite a bit of that. I try to explain phenomena. But I also review shows. And, mm-hmm. and I'll do like, no, they don't know how to use this gadget. Or like that staged because you can tell this X, Y, and Z kind of thing. Um, and I do that quite a bit. And I and I have my consumer report style stuff where I, I I review the gadgets. And if it's bunk, you know, I call it out as bunk. I just did the mm. Ovilus 5, complete bunk. No point in wasting your money on it. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Um, but you see it on all the ghosty shows. So I kind of do the thing like if if you were to do a show on monster hunting, right? You know, you, you've seen people... You know, you know what would be craft that's actually used to find a critter. Like, say, if you're going to use sonar to find Loch Ness monster or something, you probably know the science that goes into it, how the sound waves, how to, you know. And then you've got the people like, oh well, there's a big shape under there. Let's dive. You know, which doesn't always happen in real life, but it's staged for the show. Anyway, so that's 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 my approach to ghostly. I do actually, because I told you, I am getting into cryptozoology. I do have monsters on the web. Oh, that's right. Is, I forgot which that. that. That's, you know, I don't do as much with it because I'm not going mm-hmm. out monster mm-hmm. hunting that often. <laughs> often. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I do my, my legends and lore and mm-hmm. what real life phenomena could explain it. I mean, I like, I like to, to straddle between, you know, what we would expect from, like, if you were a scientist. I like to straddle mm-hmm. with that with what developed a legend or, or how the, the Le- came to be. Lore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The legends and lore. I kind of, li- I kind of like to interweave both of them. Um, but I don't tell you, no, this is, unless it's like a ghosty show where I say this is just complete bunk. Um, you know, I usually don't okay. do that. Kind of crap. Thing. 
Uh Yeah, I just throw it out there and say, you know, this is what we know. Take it or leave it. Leave a comment. It can be nasty. I know how to ban your IP address. (laughs) (laughs) Jake will hunt you down. (laughs) I won't hunt you down. I'll just make sure everyone thinks that your computer's IP address is sending out child porn. Um, Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Go make him mad. He will do. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry, Nick. I'm, I'm really a sane, nice guy. Sort of. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's get back to Nick because we only got seven yes. minutes left. Yes, let's do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, Nick, I mean, what else do you have? I mean, we know we've got time travel coming. Mm-hmm. What is possibly the next project you've started that we can get some inside scoop on? Because mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure if it comes out in September, you're probably done with the manuscript for time travel. So there might be something on the horizon. Well, actually, yeah, there is one, and uh, that'll be out after the time travel one. And it's, uh, again, it's sort of an A to Z type book, mm-hmm. and uh, it'll be all about robots. And oh. um, and you might think, you know, well, what can you, you know, in a sort of a huge book, you know, what can you actually talk about just robots? And um, it's actually quite surprising. There's a lot of legends going back thousands of years of sort of, you know, brilliance, mysterious characters who sort of built these um, sort of automated brass figures, you know, that mm-hmm. would walk along and things like this. And, you know, you've got from um, like ancient Greece and ancient Rome legends of these sort of formations, like models of okay. metal, mm-hmm. metal human devices, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, it, you know, obviously goes throughout history. So again, you've got like sec or there will be sections on, um, you know, sort of robots in pop culture, Terminator, mm-hmm. um, um, RoboCop, you know. Um, Do you have Cylons like in it? What's that? Cylons from Bellstar Galactica, are they in there? Um, well, I'm, I'm not really that far through it yet. Okay. But, um, but I've started on some of it, and um, and I started on uh, Forbidden Planet and the day the okay. Earth stood still, you know, with Gort, the giant mm-hmm. robot. But also, you know, then it sort of, it'll be sort of, go into, you know, more technological stuff in the present world, you know, so we're talking about um, the advances in sort of robotic limbs, you know, for mm. for, for soldiers who mm. may have blow, had an arm blown off or whatever, and, and to show how incredibly advanced, you know, this technology is now for, you know, to be adept, you know, with um, with like a, a faked arm or leg mm-hmm. or whatever, you know. Um, so the sections on that and also how to, you know, the, I guess it'll kind of um, sort of um, blend in where, you know, we ourselves may become to a degree, you know, centuries ahead, sort of um, maybe in a sort of robotic fashion as well. The idea of, um, you know, maybe we'll be able to live and live for a long, long time um, by, you know, we don't, we just get right now a miserable like 85 or 90 years or whatever. <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, maybe we could actually have sort of, you know, high tech um, robotic technology that would allow us to be sort of, um, you know, almost like, like the car being taken in. Mm-hmm. Okay, this needs to be fixed. You need to replace mm-hmm. it with another one of this or that. Maybe, you know, that'll be to you know, 200 years from now, maybe that'll be the normal situation. We'll have, you know, sort of, um, you know, tracking devices in us, um, mm-hmm. you know, you name it. Mm-hmm. You know, it could be, we become more and more sort of um, semi-robotic, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not that's not an impossibility, you know. So yeah. uh, so that's basically be sort of a, going back to ancient Greek, uh, ancient Greece, excuse me, um, right up to the present day and with just about everything in between. So That's cool. Yeah. Very much so. And Thank of you. course, there's an entire section on, um, you know, the, um, the, the way in which um, robots are looking, you know, more and more just like us. Mm-hmm. And um, which, you know, and some people say, you know, there's some of them, you know, they, some say, well, they look really cool. You know, somebody else say, 
you know, that one looks really hot, you know. <laughs> they um, have those robots. And then, <laughs> yeah, then you've got somebody up. But it's interesting, a lot of people, so I've, I've actually sort of already researched this, but a lot of people who see these real, really, you know, they look almost, you know, just like us, people get actually get not a fun idea from them, they actually get like a creepy vibe from them, mm -hmm. you know, um, but they're not sure why, but they just, they get a feeling there's something not right as having a, a robot that looks just like us. It must be just something in our, our minds, I guess. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of like my robots to look like tin people, to be honest. I mean, if it's not human, don't be human. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Which is kind of weird coming from me because I'm all pro tech. <laughs> right, but still, yeah, there there is yeah. a that line once again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robot from Lost in Space. There we go. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Or the mm -hmm. Jetsons. Yes, that one too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alrighty, well, we are coming up to time. So, Nick, yes, yes. if I, I do have one more quick question with the world opening back up. Do you have any con appearances coming up? Um, yes. Um, in um, September, I'll be speaking at the, um, the annual uh, Mothman Moth Festival okay. um, in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Um, mm -hmm. I go there usually every um, second year with a bunch of friends and we, cause it's like an 18 hour drive from, here in Texas, in Dallas. So uh, there's like four of us, and um, every time we do the 18 mile, uh, excuse me, the, <laughs> the 18 hour drive, um, and then the 18 uh, drive uh, hour drive back again. Um, we do that every other year. So there's like four of us, and we take the turns mm -hmm. driving. And um, and this year I'm going to be speaking about um, the UK equivalents of Mothman. Uh, there's a oh. one that's known as Owlman, uh, which is like a I, pretty much it looks just like Mothman, like glowing eyes and wings, but with a humanoid figure. So uh, that's what I'll be talking about the the whole um, Mothman phenomenon as it relates to uh, to the UK side of things. That's cool. Is it is it? Do you consider it a harbinger as well as you know as as a lot of us do the Mothman? Well, yeah, I mean, you could certainly make a case for that. I mean, for example, you know, when the events at Point Pleasant in West Virginia happened, at um, you know, the Silver Bridge collapsed in uh, December 1967, and, um, you know, dozens of people died um, when the bridge fell into the Ohio River. And even John Keel, before this, before the tragedy happened, had this um, sort of, creepy vibe that something was going to happen in in the town and it did um, just before christmas in december 67 um now you could make it you know the idea of you know like some you know some sort of um you know creature of doom or whatever you know harbinger of, of fear or whatever you know or you know something along those lines mm -hmm. however there is the fact as well that Mothman didn't do anything else like that. You know, there hasn't been any sort of large scale um, disasters where people have seen a Mothman. So it mm -hmm. makes you wonder what if it is sort of a creature that appears when disasters are about to happen or it causes it. Um, why don't we see more of them? Um, you know, we don't yeah. actually get to see that many of them. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can with a lot of these things, you know, there's no kind of a sense of common sense um but there's no doubt in my mind you know that the you know the phenomenon of these winged strange creatures all around the world that in itself is um is uh, you know uh, a subject to be looked at and that's why mm -hmm. you know i'm gonna talk about the british ones because a lot mm -hmm. of people yeah. probably won't know much about them because they just haven't really been you know the subject of a great deal of focus really mm -hmm. Um, we do have a comment, which will go into my very last question of the evening. Right. But the comment <laughs> comes from Brenda. She's your number one fan. Um, so Brenda says, I love Nick. I try not to miss an episode of Ancient Aliens. I watch for hours every fr Friday night. It, 
actually my favorite show. So that's from Brenda. Oh, well, thanks, Brenda. <laughs> and since... I'll, let know. I'll let people know if um, when there's some other shows coming on. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm not sure what's going on yet. So. Okay. That's why I was going to ask is where will we see Nick on TV, cable, or streaming soon? Um, well, right now, I, I haven't got anything, you know, that's sort of coming immediately. And mainly it's because, you know, with the whole COVID thing, a mm. lot of the TV companies shut down for, a, you know, with the shows for a, a quite a while, well, a long time, because, you know, they they just didn't want to risk going out into the fields and flying and everything else. So that's why you can see quite a few of these, you know, these shows you know, on every Friday night, Thursday night, you know, there's a lot of reruns. Um, but now that things are sort of clearing up a bit, you know, hopefully, um, you know, things will pick up and there'll be, I mean, it's like with conferences, you know, they're all starting to open up again now. So I'm sure, you know, the TV stuff, because a lot of the TV shows that are that have been shown now, like Thursday and Friday nights, I know from being on them, you know, that some of those that we see now, um, were actually br uh, broadcast first, like about three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to keep them going. Um, but but yeah, you know, I think now things are started picking to up, um, and we'll be in a situation where, you know, things will be hopefully, you know, where we should be. <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. so yeah, but uh, I haven't got a few um, TV things coming along but um but it's not sort of immediate it'll be uh you know a few months down the road probably nice wonderful well thank you for being on with us tonight this has been another oh, well, wonderful uh, conversation yay! thanks Nick. yeah well thanks for having me on as well we uh we covered a lot and um you know it, uh, and that's mm -hmm. a good thing you know uh, when you can sort of expand into a lot of different areas as well so oh yeah yep yeah sure. mm -hmm. um oh. well before we sign off let me give the plugs one last time so yes. folks you mm -hmm. can get nick's new book diary of secrets ufo conspiracies and the mysterious death of marilyn monroe uh in kindle or paperback it's published by laura higgins books it came out in uh, this past May, and then September 1st will be Time Travel from Visible Ink Press, and you can pre-order it now. We dropped the link in the Facebook uh, comment oh. section. Well, you know what you could also do? You mm -hmm. could actually time, tra you could time travel into the future and go and get the book right now. <laughs> and then come back and spoil it. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. We'll just have a special one up. We'll be like, don't tell Nick. Page one. There's an error on it. It's like, there's a typo. What? Yeah. <laughs> Damn it, I got a draft. <laughs> all righty then. Well, if that's all, I guess we're we're about done for this evening. We, we're probably going to make a shift shortly to a, another night, a weekend night. Um, Jake and I are hashing that out, and we will let you know. I so I don't have anybody lined up for next week, but I could with no problem. So, mm -hmm. um, everybody, have a good, safe weekend. Have fun out there. Go howl at the moon during the, the <laughs> solstice on Sunday, and uh, we'll we'll catch you later. Thanks for tuning in, folks. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Nick. Nick. All right, thanks, guys. Thanks okay. a lot. Uh, and Goodbye, no more genius You should have known to stay away If you think that Hollywood is tough You shouldn't meet the CIA A couple pills and a couple drinks We know just what they'll do No